Okay, so saltwater crocodiles are our next type of reptile that we're going to be um, talking about. And so saltwater crocodiles are found in salt water. That's why they're called saltwater crocodiles. Uh -huh. They're also called estuarine crocodiles because they can be found in estuaries. And estuaries are where rivers run into the ocean. So it has what we call brackish water, meaning it's like half fresh water, half seawater. So it's not quite as salty as seawater, but not fresh water. Okay. Um, and so they live in Australia and the Indian Ocean. Um, you can find them like uh, in India as well. And that they're the reason why it's like bad news to swim in certain parts of Australia. So like in certain areas of Australia, you're not supposed to go swimming because there's saltwater crocodiles. And saltwater crocodiles are not like sharks. They don't like mistake, you know, people for food and then, you know, take a bite and then leave. Um, saltwater crocodiles will hunt people. Okay, so they will actually go after people for food. Um, and it happens regularly. People ignore signs like, hey, don't swim here. And then they swim there and then they die because they are eaten by a saltwater crocodile. And they, these guys do not mess around. Okay, they are probably the most aggressive animal in the ocean because they will hunt people for food. So it's not good. Um, they do spend most of their time close to shore, but they can go out to sea. So they can actually migrate for hundreds of miles in the open ocean if they need to. Um, and so they can swim out to sea. They eat mostly fish, but can kill people. Um, and then they are hunted for their skin because their skin makes great leather. So for like a crocodile skin purse, you know, or shoes or a belt, okay? So people will hunt them for those reasons. And actually in Australia, they actually have saltwater crocodile farms. So um, we went to one when we went with the school on the trip and like they showed us like where they hatch like the little babies, like, and they have the little hatchlings. And then we saw them feed like some of the bigger ones. And they even took us out, it was crazy, on a boat. So in this big pond where a lot of them live. And it had like these big things up the sides so the saltwater crocodile can get into the boat. Um, and then the guide at the front had like this big stick that had like this dead chicken carcass on it. And he would like take and like slap the carcass on the water and then lift it. And the crocodiles would jump out and like slam their jaws oh. closed. It was insane. I dreamt of saltwater crocodiles that night. It was like freaky. So. They can jump out of the water and like get things and of course their eyes are like the freaky like cat slits, right? And so it just they just freak me out. So they're crazy. Alright. So that's the saltwater crocodile. Sea snakes are another kind of reptile that you'll find in the ocean. Um, and again, they're found mostly in Australia and the Indian Ocean, but that's not the only place where they're found. Um, they are venomous. In fact, the most venomous snake in the world is considered to be a sea snake. Okay. Yep. Um, so they're venomous. They do tend to stay near shore, but not always. They like to hang out around like coral reefs and stuff because that's where their main prey items are. And they do eat fish and eels. So, and they will do that by ambush hunting. So they'll kind of like, they'll hide and then pop out and grab the fish that swims by or the eel. They so how many of you have ever eaten a um, fish and then you've gotten like one of the little bones right, that of the fish and like in your mouth and then you have to like pull it out and it's like super annoying? Okay. Uh, so they, they eat these fish whole, right, just like any other snake would eat something whole. Um, and they can't digest these bones. So rather than like risking having these bones like move through their intestinal tract and then like pooping out the bone, um, and risk having it like, you know, puncture their intestines, what do they do? Well, this is the weirdest thing, I think. Um, they actually push those bones out of their body wall. Whoa. So, like, they will, it's, I know, when I first heard that, I was like, what? No, like, that's not possible. Um, but they literally, like, imagine you eating, like, a, a whole chicken. You swallow a whole chicken, right? And then you can't digest the bones, so you just, like, push the bones out of your body wall. That's what they do. It's not like pew, 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 pew. It's not like fast. <laughs> it's like, um, <laughs> it's like a slow process. Oh, okay. So, so like, um, like, so like the bones are like the little, the little fish bones, right? Yeah. So it'll take a couple days and they'll heal behind it, but it'll be like, that's crazy. 
No. How often? They're reptiles, so they don't have to eat that often. Um, anyways, crazy, right? So weird. Um, and then they're viviparous. Guys. Viviparous. So sea snakes are the only type of reptile that are viviparous. So that means that they don't actually have to return to land to lay eggs. They, can, they give live birth okay, in the ocean. Um, here's different pictures of different kinds of sea snakes. Uh, sea snakes also have like a flattened paddle-like tail. So normal snakes are like tapered at each end, whereas these guys have a flattened paddle-like tail that they use to swim through the water. Okay, um, this is a picture of Steve Irwin the day before he died. The day before he died, he was wrestling a toxic sea snake. Um, that is a giant sea snake. They are normally not that large. So he, that is a very, very large sea snake. Yeah. Um, so the day before he died, he was wrestling the sea snake, and the sea snake like whipped around and was like, you know, bared its fangs, like gonna bite the guy, um, and like he moved so it couldn't. Um, but basically, the day before Steve Irwin actually died by a stingray, he almost died by sea snake, because these guys are very venomous. Yeah. All right, <coughs> the faint banded sea snake. Faint banded sea snake is the most toxic snake in the world, and it is a sea snake. Um, so, the inland taipan is the second most venomous snake in the world, and the faint banded sea snake's toxins are considered to be a hundred times more potent than the <laughs> than the. <inland coughs> so, this snake could kill you in less than half an hour. All right, if it bites you, but. Sea snakes are very docile, all right? So um, th really the only way that people get bitten by sea snakes is like fishermen <laughs> who like throw their nets out, right? And then gather up their net and then there's a sea snake caught in the net. And so they're like trying to get the sea snake out. The sea snake gets all irritated because it feels threatened and it's on land. And so it bites, okay? And so they're far from medical care and they die. Um, so that's very rare. So sea snakes, if you, you see them in the water, they're going to swim away from you. They, they're not going to be like, ooh, human, <laughs> like try and get you. Okay, so they're not they're not going to try and come after you. Um, so they're very docile, and like the faint banded sea snake, uh, it it will bite people. So like what we're talking about, like trying to get them out of nets and stuff. But only about 25% of the time does it actually inject venom. So it'll bite. They'll do what are called dry bites where they'll bite, but they won't actually inject venom. So only about a quarter of the time do they actually inject venom. So, so if you, well, you'll, you'll feel it pretty quickly. Um, and like if you squeeze the wound, um, sometimes you'll get a little bit of the venom to come out and it'll either be like this clear or yellow color and then you'll know. And then you've got less than half an hour to get to a hospital and hopefully survive. Uh, answer venom. So where they're found, okay, they're found around the Philippines, New Guinea, Australia, of course, Solomon Islands, Gulf of Thailand, it's where you'll find them, all right? And you can see the picture of them in the background, yeah? Okay. All right, birds, birds. We are in class A's, which are birds. General characteristics of this class, they have feathers. Birds have feathers, okay? So even birds that interact with the ocean are going to have feathers. Also, most of them can fly. Not all of them, but some of them can't fly. Can, or most of them can fly, but some of them can't. Um, like penguins, like ostrich, chickens, peacocks, that sort of thing, right? So, mm, not well. Not well. So they... Most of them can fly. Okay, they are oviparous, which means they lay eggs, and they have to return to land to lay eggs and raise their young. And if you look at their feet you can, and their beak, you can actually tell a lot about their lifestyle. Okay, so what they're going to eat, how they eat, whether they spend lots of time out at sea or whether they spend more time closer to shore. Okay, um, and then lastly, they are endothermic, meaning they can maintain their own body temperature. So despite the surrounding water temperature or air temperature. So 
your emperor penguins can live in Antarctica and maintain a body temperature that is consistent despite being in negative 70 degrees Celsius weather. Okay, so they can maintain their own body temperature. It's called being endothermic. Another term that you will hear for that is homeothermic. So homeothermic, endothermic, same thing. All right, so make sure if you see either of those terms on your quiz or your test, don't get confused, okay? Um, we also say animals that can maintain their own body temperature, we say that they're warm-blooded, all right? So birds are endothermic, and you can see different pictures of different types of birds. So we split birds that interact with the ocean into two groups basic group. We have shorebirds and seabirds. Shorebirds interact with the ocean and spend most of their time closer to shore, whereas seabirds can spend most of their time out to sea. All right, super hard to remember. So shorebirds spend most of their time along the shoreline, very, very rarely out at sea, and you can actually tell um, whether the bird that you're looking at is a shorebird or a seabird just by looking at its feet. Okay, so if you look at its feet, um, you can tell. So a shorebird, I'll scroll back up so you can get your notes, but a shorebird, its feet are not going to be webbed, okay? So it'll, it'll have its toes separated, okay? So you, see, you can all see that on this little art, or uh, little snowy plover, right? Seabirds will have webbed feet, okay? So just by looking at their feet, you can tell if they're a seabird or a shorebird. I would recommend that you know how to do that. Hopefully it's an easy point on your quiz, okay? So web feet seabird, not web feet shorebird. Um, and the reason why like shorebirds have to spend their time around land um, is because they don't have webbed feet. So because they don't have those webbed feet, they can't land on the water and then take off again. Whereas seabirds have these webbed feet, and so they can land on the water and use those webbed feet to start paddling and get up speed and take off. So shorebirds have to stay close to land. They can't land on water. They have to come back to land in order to rest. Seabirds can go out to sea, land on water, rest, take off again. Does that make sense? Just sitting on top of the water. Yeah, just like a duck would like float on top of water, they would just sit on the top of the water out in the open ocean. So, um, yeah. And um, kind of interestingly, a lot of shorebirds actually stay in California for the summer or for the winter. So we'll see a lot of birds that we don't normally see during the winter here because this is where they stay. And then when it's summertime, they fly up to the Arctic. So we get to see lots of different kinds of birds. Their beaks, their beaks are cool. Um, if you look at their beaks, you can actually tell a lot about what they're going to be eating. So, and their beaks actually also help to reduce competition for food. Because if they have different shapes and different lengths of beaks, they can be eating different things all in the same spot. So here is a picture to help you see this. So this bird all the way here on the left, that's a curlew. It's got a, a long curved bill. It's going to be reaching deeper in the sand and getting things like worms and also clams and stuff that, stuff that lives deeper in the sand. Whereas if you compare that to a plover, okay, all the way here on the right, it's going to be eating amphipods and stuff that are closer to the surface of the sand. So these two birds, in fact, all four of these birds, could be eating in the same area, right? But they're eating different things because they're eating at different depths in the sand. Do you see that? So the length of the beak actually helps to reduce the competition for food. Um, and by looking at their beak, you can tell something about what they're eating. Kind of cool, huh? So there you go. We could spend like a long time talking about different kinds of birds because there are a lot of different kinds of birds. We're only going to briefly mention some of the ones that you'll see in California, right? Because we could spend months on birds. Literally pretty much every topic that we cover in this class, we could spend months and months talking about. But so birds, we're gonna just talk about very briefly. One of the types of birds that you'll see here is the oyster catcher. Okay, and you can tell it's an oyster catcher because it'll have black body and then it has orange eyes, beak, and feet. Okay, everything else is orange. It is going to eat things like clams, all sorts of shellfish, limpets, crabs, worms at rocky shoreline. That's what it looks like. It's 18 inches head to tail, so it's, it's going to be about that big. It's a little bit of a bigger bird. Okay, and then here you can see its um, habitat, where it lives. 
all right? So all the way down from like Baja, California, all the way up to like the coast of Alaska. Curlews, you will see around here, um, only during the winter. So right now, you'd be able to see a curlew. Um, they have this long curved bill, which gives them their very distinctive look. They're going to be eating in sandy and muddy habitats and eating things like clams and worms that are deep in the sand. You can see them around the Ventura River mouth or at your local beaches. All right, that's what they look like. And they are 23 inches head to tail, so they're even bigger. They're almost two feet from head to tail, right? So, and then they've got those long legs and the long bill. So they're not small birds. Clovers. There's many different types of clovers. Um, but clovers are going to be small, particularly when compared to other shorebirds. They're only going to be about six inches, so they're going to be, you know, like that big. You little birds. Um, you'll, they're very common on beaches. You'll see them all over, and they're going to eat amphipods and things near the surface. Um, the snowy plover is a type of plover that you'll find here year-round. Um, they live in California, and they are endangered. The okay. reason why they are actually endangered is because uh, they lay their eggs on the sand, okay, and because that's that's where they make their nests, and those eggs are very well camouflaged against the sand. And so when people walk on the beach, step on the eggs and crush the eggs. And so the little baby birds don't hatch. Um, also, the parents are very skittish. So even if you just get too close to the nest, they just like throw up their wings and go away. All right, they're like, oh, that's it, I'm, I, can't, I can't come back, can't come back. <laughs> and so they just like leave and they don't come back. And so the eggs don't make it because they're not being incubated and they don't hatch and it's sad. Poor baby snowy plovers. Um, if you see at a beach a sign that looks like this, okay, that is what they're warning you about. They're saying, like, don't go in this area because this is where snowy plovers nest. They're protected by the Endangered Species Act, and you can be fined thousands of dollars. So don't do it, all right? Save the snowy plover, don't step on their babies, and don't get fined thousands of dollars. Here's what they look like. <coughs> so they're cute. I know, they're adorable. Um, and one that's eating, and then here you can see the um, eggs in the sand. So it's, they're very well camouflaged, right? Okay. Sandpipers. And sandpipers are one of the types of birds that you will see at the beach that will be running up and down when the waves go in and out. So when the waves go out and they run up, okay, and then the, when the waves come back in and they run back up, that's, uh, that's one of the types of birds that does that is a sandpiper. Uh, they are mostly here during the winter. They're eating small crustaceans and clams. Here's what they look like. They're six to eight inches depending on the species. So this, so like this, right? So they're not huge birds. Two types that you'll see, the least sandpiper and the western sandpiper. And then here's compared to like the size of a teacup, so you can just get an idea. Yeah, they're little. So that's what they look like. Um, Sanderlings are another type that you'll find. They eat crustaceans and clams. Sanderlings are another type of bird that will be running up and down the beach as the waves come in and out. Okay, so they're. And you, a lot of times you'll actually see like flocks of both sanderlings and sandpipers together, running up and down. They're eating insects. You can see a picture of what they look like there. Um, and you see them all over the place. All right. They're a little bit bigger. They're eight inches from head to tail. And they're cute, too. And it's fun to run through the flocks of them and make them fly away. I mean, I don't condone that. And then our last type of shorebird are herons and egrets. Um, we have an egret that like likes to chill out here, right? So sometimes in the front right here, and then sometimes over by the Calvary parking lot, that big white bird that hangs out, um, that's an egret. So herons and egrets are found like around canals and harbors, 
or like marshy areas. So it's probably feeding somewhere around here in like Westlake or something like that. Um, they're going to eat fish and invertebrates. So you'll see them as they like feed. They're like they'll walk like in the water like this guy, this heron right here. So they'll walk and then they like will pause and they'll stop and they'll just like stay there for a while. And then you'll see them like shoot their head forward and they shoot their head down into the water and capture the fish or the hopefully capture the fish or the invertebrate, right? Um, so these guys are 42 to 52 inches, the great, uh, the blue heron. So those, oh man, they're going to be like, they're going to be big birds, okay? And then you're, um, you have two types of egrets we'll see around here, the great egret and the snowy egret. The great egret, you can tell it's a great egret because it's got a yellow beak and black feet, whereas the snowy egret is sm slightly smaller and then it's got a black beak and yellow feet. Okay, so you can tell the difference that way today. Okay, so seabirds. Seabirds spend most of their time at sea. That's why they're called seabirds. I know, it's weird. Um, they do have to return to land to mate and lay eggs. But like, for example, um, the albatross, albatross babies will actually spend their first two years of life out to sea and never come back to land. So um, only when they're ready to reproduce after a couple of years will they actually return back to land. The rest of the time they're, they're out to sea flying or like resting on the surface of the water. So yeah, that's pretty cool. Yes, that's a puffin. Their feet are webbed, they are good swimmers. Um, and they can land and take off of water. Iceland. Yeah, puffins are found in Iceland. Yeah. Their beak. You can tell a lot about what a seabird eats and how it eats by their beak, just like you can with shorebird beaks. Um, you can particularly tell a lot more about how it eats by the by the beak for a seabird. So. If you look, here's the pictures, a picture to help you see it. So the penguin and cormorant, these first two here on the left, those are pursuit divers. What does that mean? That means that they're like swimming underwater, chasing their prey like fish and krill. Okay. Um, so they have very streamlined, sharp beaks. Okay. Whereas like the blue-footed booby will actually take and will hover above the water about at about 70 feet sometimes, and then it will plunge, dive down into the water to capture its food. So it's going to need a much sturdier beak to withstand the impact. It's also going to need more of like a wedge-shaped beak, so like a diver, right? So to kind of like separate the water as it dives in. Um, and then, and so that's, it, that's exactly what its beak looks like, right? More wedge-shaped and stronger. Um, and then you've got skimmers, okay? Skimmers that have a longer lower beak than an upper beak. Okay, and th the way that they use that is they'll take and actually glide over the surface of the water and keep that lower bill into the into the water, right? So they're swimming along, swimming along. When something touches that beak, they slam that beak closed and they capture their food. So by having that longer lower jaw, it allows for them to swim like that and capture their food. 